We have this meeting of community of learners, and Alicia Dominguez is going to do talking chips. Elizabeth is going to do questions. Yvette is icebreakers. Ashley Olson did teacher student relationships. Okay, so icebreakers was done by Yvette. And um, so icebreakers provide an opportunity for students and instructors to get to know each other. It's a positive learning experience and it's very successful and retains students. So I'm sorry, I'm oh, sorry. 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 Uh, be, she wrote, be excited about the prospect of moving on and this is a new beginning, the start of what you want. So the benefit breakers are the first day it reduces anxiety and people don't feel isolated. So it actively engages the participants and has them break down barriers. Um, it, find out, it finds out what is, people have in common. And the atmosphere is good because everyone feels comfortable. So it helps build a shared sense of purpose and community. Oh, make way for more powerful and meaningful interaction and relationships. Okay, so you can do icebreakers at the beginning of the class, the middle of the class, or the end of the class. So if you do it at the beginning of the class, it kind of helps with tension because a lot of students don't know each other. And then if you do it in the middle of the class, it helps recharge and kind of go over some things that are a reflection. And then at the end of the class, it provides a reflective time. And I'm in... I'm in the clinical setting. I'm doing skills lab for nursing. So I'm definitely going to do this because it was a seven week class. So the, um, we're going to do, I'm going to do something with toilet paper and the kids, students are going to come in the room. There's about 40 of them and they're going to take a piece of toilet paper as much as they want. And then how many ever pieces of squares they take of the toilet paper, they're going to, um, say what they learned in the class and how they felt it was beneficial. <laughs> so I thought that was funny. Since we're nursing, you know, the toilet paper. <laughs> okay, so simple, that was just my throw in. Okay, so simple icebreaker examples. She chose um, each person tell two truths and one lie, and they get up in front of the class, and the class has to sell, oh, sorry, the class has to say which one is the lie about the students, you know, so I thought that was great. So then the other, the other way to icebreak is to say um, what person they, celebrity or figure in historical society and explain why they chose that person. And then the last one was that they break in groups and so they come up with what they have in common with each other and then there's a person that at the very end they kind of collaborate what the uniquenesses of that group is. I uh, want to add here, I do the um, uh, two truths and a lie, but I use the chapter um, information. So they, it's kind of like an icebreaker for the chapter, and so they'll say something that's not true, and then if you read your chapter, you know what it is. <laughs> so the considerations that Yvette had was uh, you need to look at the time you have, What's the perfect timing to introduce it to the class and uh, will have a positive impact and kind of like what do you want to accomplish in this group and the icebreaker, the simplicity of it, like is it easy to explain, how, you know, or the, you think that the students are going to understand it. And then you also look at the age and cultural differences and mobility, if they can move around or not, and then also their personality. And then I think the technique for interrupting some participants, they do start talking and they get a little out there. So you have to kind of have a technique to interrupt. So I kind of walk around and make sure they're on target and bring them back and say, well, this is what we're working on. And uh, you have to consider debriefing at the end, like with the students. Do they like this activity? Would they recommend it to the next class I'm going to teach? And so on. So I'm Alicia Dominguez, and um, I chose talking chips. Uh, students are uh, put in a group of four and given a chip. So either, you know, I was thinking creatively, if I don't have chips, buy some candy with wrapped, and then they can have that app as they go. Everybody wants food. Uh, for each discussion contribution, the student places a chip in the center of the pile. 
with little effort, they rem uh, they're reminded to share. I work with the students that are um, uh, integrating reading and writing. So they're the first, they, we see them for their first class, most likely, if they are not at college level. And so they don't really know how to interact in a group. Um, so you're always going to have that one person who talks a little bit more. And so this really allows that to uh, flow a little bit better. Um, part of the community of learning, we need to build a physical space for learning. We create a community of learners by providing a safe opportunity to develop listening, speaking, and sharing. Those three, I think, components are really important because um, if you have the talker, they're going to really kind of control the group. Uh, but that thinker needs that opportunity, and so that chip is that opportunity to have that conversation. Um, and uh, other ways to reach out to the learner is to accommodate specific ability with different intelligences. So I'm thinking about two particular type of students, the uh, interpersonal students, so that if we're going to meet the needs of that student, we need to provide a quiet time for them to think. They're not ready to speak up, which we have to, uh, you know, and I do have the shy students, and they're not ready, but I think this really gives them an opportunity to say, okay, now I'm ready. I've thought my thoughts through. I'm going to put my chip in the, in the pile. And then we usually have plenty of the verbal linguistic students, and their way, their mo um, motivation and is, is to learn through their speaking, reading information, asking questions, and participating in discussion. They acquire knowledge through lectures, spoken instruction, and repeating terms out loud. So we have the talking chips. We have the students that are re receiving that color. And I even thought about color chips, how uh, if you're a visual learner, you know, if, you were, if they don't know when to talk, you could say, OK, it's time for all of the red chips to talk, uh, or all of the green chips to talk. Um, so I really do think about those, those, that particular type of learner. Um, I like the idea of a quiet time for students to think through their ideas. And of course, um, as a teacher, we are um, providing some guidance, and then there's the share. All right, the next area, um, talking chips allow students to take an, an active role in their learning style. So I picked uh, three particular types of style. The chip incorporating uh, kinesthetic learning. The hands-on learner is given a chance to construct meaning to their response while holding, flipping, rubbing their chip. So a student who is kinesthetic, um, it isn't that they're nervous. Do you know the student who kind of taps on the, they're not nervous. They're just thinking it through. You know, so if you have that chip in their hand, we're allowing them to think through, which is just perfectly fine. Um, the chip encouraged is the auditory learner, again, with a little self-control. Uh, express and develop their own ideas, and students can discuss and support each other in terms of their own learning. Uh, keeping all of that in mind, I wanted to bring up one particular learner, the integrating the autonomous learner. That one student who says, I don't want to work in a group. No, thank you. <laughs> and they will stay, hang back. Uh, I'm that person. I, I'm, it's really hard for me to come to the group. Um, but I think this would be a really uh, great way for that student to come to a group and going from a small group to a, you know, a little bit more intimate to a lar than a larger group. And hopefully they can at least maybe not become that verbal learner, uh, but at least we're taking care of their own needs, which is it's important. You can't change the way somebody learns, I believe. Okay, creating a safe place to learn. Um, think about physically clustering desks together and allowing students to discuss ideas informally with their neighbors. Um, again, a safe place, instead of from the large group to the small group. Moving those desks around occasionally, which is something that Elizabeth was talking about in the other. Let's move those desks around, because sometimes we get, I get comfortable with Elizabeth and I don't want to talk to anybody else. Um, and so creating that safe place outside of what they're comfortable with, um, letting them explore. Um, I want to think about the hearing impaired student. All right, so again, where are they located? Uh, can, once we sit in a small group, 
um, you know, Elizabeth can tell me, oh, that's what the professor asked us to do. And it's not um, intimidating anymore, because now I have somebody that can repeat, repeat the information. <coughs> Okay, so now I have creating a community of learners using questions. Um, the question is a key part of the learning process, and questions have been an effective strategy as a teaching tool. Questions uh, draw out prior knowledge, and they raise key concepts for the students that are learning, and questions stimulate new awareness and discussion. So I'm just going to talk about that. So questions that I see, um, the questions about the learning process, it really does challenge students. Since I work in um, clinical lab, the students, I, I kind of challenge them one-on-one -on -one when I'm doing the checkoffs, and then I challenge them in sm like small groups. There's like 11 in my group, so I usually divide them five and five and pose different qu questions um, to get their attention. So questions can be aimed at discussing life experiences. The students in these groups come and they have different life experiences and what's so nice is that they're in this cohort and they know each other and they've been there, they were there before I was there because um, I'm adjunct. So it's, um, it's good to know that who works, who doesn't work, who's, um, I learned in the group, one girl we were doing post-mortem care and she started sobbing and all the children said, Miss Buckley, it's okay. Um, her mother just died of cancer, so I didn't know that, so it was kind of good that they supported each other. So questions check for understanding. Um, students, the questions that you can ask can help um, understand what struggles they're going through, how they're relating, do they understand the knowledge that you're teaching, the concepts. So it also can say, like, what, think back on working on a certain problem and what was a positive outcome. And then if, they, if you do it one-on-one, -on -one, you can share it with the group so everyone can learn from each other. So um, questions also check for understanding. I like how, you know, we're, they're always meeting together and working with each other. And that's real important in this, like, I call it a cohort. And so they motivate each other. They help each other if they don't understand. They do studying together. So that's real important. So the questions as an effective teaching tool. Um, it helps recall information. I want you to go to the next one. Okay, questions can be focused to help students justify their position. I would like to say the question that I sometimes ask is like, would you use Demerol on a patient that has substance abuse? And I always ask why or why not? So then it helps them justify their position. So then questions can generate a list of ideas. So I might say, would you include a husband in the care of his wife who has cancer and she's only 25? And so give the, your, so half the room could say their viewpoints and make a list of ideas, I'm sorry, and on the other side, the viewpoints, they could discuss that and then we can come together. And that would be a great learning discussion. So questions can analyze, evaluate, and create. This is probably my favorite. Um, analyzing and nursing is very important. So I would say, given the certain uh, symptoms, what is the likely causes of her pain? So that's analyzing it and kind of distinguishing it and deducing what the problem is. And then evaluate, I would say, uh, based on this study, like of 20 students, what do you think we should do? What's causing their anxiety, their fears, their worries? Um, and then the create part, um, I use this a lot because nurses have to make care plans. And so, um, I would say this patient has been to the hospital five times in six months for chronic uh, pain and anxiety. So how are we going to manage this patient so she won't come back to the ER again? And that's okay. And the last one is um, low and high level questions. So we're all students in a community. We need to know like their ba their knowledge base. If they're low level, high level questions. So uh, for me, like I teach vital signs, y'all all know everybody gets that done at the hospital or doctor. So the nurse has to know how to apply the, the stethoscope, I mean the, the blood pressure cuff and where to put the stethoscope. She has to understand the knowledge like what's the normal blood pressure, what's the normal vital signs. So she knows when the abnormal is, or he, sorry we have lots of guys. So I chose uh, what makes you choose nursing. So one lady could say, my grandmother made me choose nursing, but that's not enough. I want to know more. 
So what made you choose nursing and what influenced you? And then she goes, oh, well, my grandmother lived with us from the time I was in seventh grade. I took care of her because my mom worked nights. And um, I knew because the home health nurse came in and I loved her and she taught me a lot. And so I wanted to become a nurse. So that tells me a lot more. And then the other example I chose was what's a normal blood pressure. It's one over 80. But what are you going to do, uh, students in the community of learners, um, if the blood pressure is 210 over 120? Yeah, you're going to kind of, well, they're going to scream first, no kidding. Um, so then uh, they're going to go, well, is she having chest pain? What are the other symptoms? Is she sweating? Is she... Um, you know, what's going on, because that's, I would call 911 for that might be a heart attack. But if she's just been normal and all of a sudden her blood pressure gets elevated, they have to go to the doctor quickly and call for a medication stat, which is immediately in nursing, and then look at, um, then the doctor's going to say, evaluate this person, you know, every 15 minutes and call me back. So, okay, that's good. All right, and our fourth uh, topic uh, for creating community of learners is to consider the teacher-student relationship. So we want to do that through email, office appointments, um, groups, groups through outings, quizzes, and activities. Uh, weekly emails. So weekly emails allow students to get an idea of an instructor's presence. Again, community, really focusing on how do we create this community. That allows to communicate flow from instructor to student, uh, and it's also a nice way to email, have the students email each other outside of a group project, uh, which is something that happened to yes, us. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I work uh, in a lab, and so I try to, and I know we're all busy, but I try to at least email the students on a quarterly basis. So even if it's just, you know, if you're behind on an assignment, if you haven't gone into tutoring, don't forget all of the services that are out there for you. So I kind of have a generic email, but it does bring that student back who has, you know, maybe not passing to realize, okay, if I go back to tutoring, I'm still in the ball game. You know, I'm, I'm not in the seventh inning yet. I do, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I do want to add that in the dual credit courses, they're not used to this uh, emailing back and forth, so I give them a point. If you email me that you're, you're doing okay, all of a sudden I get all these emails. <laughs> right, 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 yeah. The, 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 where do you find the email? You know, let's find that. Um, office visits, this is a really cute picture. Uh, picture number one depicts office visits in which a student assumes they are in trouble. I think that really is the negative connotation. Oh, my professor asked me to see me. I must be in trouble. Something's going wrong. Um, so we want to kind of take care of all of that. And so the second picture depicts uh, just that welcoming, um, willing to help with the student, knowing them by name. And I know that's really hard, but if somebody emails me, I might jot down their name and, and try to make a connection uh, on a much more intimate level. Office visits uh, can be at the discretion of the instructor. Uh, it is also good as, uh, to establish relationship with students because of life stressors. A student, we can't complete an assignment if we have some personal things going on. So even just that just that uh, visit might help out. Because we all want retention, right? <laughs> we don't want them to go away. Uh, act activities outside the classroom. Uh, we all have lives outside the classroom. However, attending events uh, in the community as a class outside, um, things that, that we have here on campus. Um, it may not be in your particular subject, but that is creating that community. They're outside of their uh, the discipline that they're working with. And um, I'm always amazed at how students will say, oh yeah, well she was with me in that class, and they bonded. Um, so now it isn't just the classroom, but it's the community, community outside of your class. Depending on the subject and uh, what, uh, excuse me, depending on the subject type, many centers around the community offer uh, group discounts. Um, I know, is there anybody here that's in, um, the arts. Um, I, I'm really fascinated with what um, that particular, just they go out and, you know, they see plays together, they might see uh, different, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's just a great thing to do. 
um, it's always nice to throw an invitation out to the students. Uh, pique their interest, see what they're interested in. All right, next slide, uh, group uh, quizzes and tests. How many of you do group, group quizzes? Cool. All right, um, that's a challenge. Uh, group quizzes and tests are not very common in many classrooms. Quizzes and tests are typically used to measure the knowledge of each individual, and I guess you can attest to that. I use both of them. Both of them. All right, cool. Yeah. What I do is, want me to tell you real quick? Sure, tell us. I teach sociology, so what they do is they come in, they'll take their test, and they have an option before this actually happened. A couple of weeks before we have the exam, we'll set up groups. Usually, it's just by lottery. So everybody is in a group, about four or five people an exam, you take the test individually, and then once you finish with the test, you, come, you sit back down with your test, you know, just the answers, and as your group, you go back through it, and you answer the, the quiz again, and I average those two grades. And that, in order to keep doing that, you have to have made an individual score of 70, so that you just can't, you know, sponge off of everybody else. That means for the next exam, if your individual grade wasn't a 70, you cannot participate. And if your individual grade is higher than the group average, you keep your individual score. So the way I use it, they're over there talking about the subject matter again. They're, you know, this is why I think, and because I want them to know the material. Right. Yeah. So yeah. That's, yeah. that's, 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 that's cool. good. That's good. Um, I need Thank you for that. Our classmate added the idea of brainstorming, which is kind of what you're talking about and uh, other inputs to complete their knowledge on that certain topic. Uh, numbers, group papers. Um, I, I guess it's kind of what we're doing right now. So mm -hmm. instead of, uh, uh, so we have a group paper, a wonderful way for students to think about the writing process. You know, some, some students um, have had that writing uh, course, but it's good to refresh and not many students are aware of how complex the writing paper is. You're writing a six-page document. How do I put six pages uh, together? And so maybe this group paper can work together. Um, working in groups help people learn about other people and uh, other viewpoints, which I find pretty amazing. All right, and then um, just overall, uh, the teacher-student relationship should be a positive one. We are their uh, allies and sometimes they're not sure about that. Nobody is perfect and we're all about continuing to learn throughout our life experience. Creating this relationship is imperative for, again, a positive working experience for the instructor and lifelong impact on students. Anyone has the power to make um, a positive difference in someone's life, why not? Why not you? That is a community of learners. Yeah.